I want to welcome you here to this series. It's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I've turned 60 years old this, uh, this year, and it seemed like my body started falling apart. My wife says it started falling apart when I was about 25. But anyways, I now have to have reading glasses whenever I read the Bible, and I'm going to be reading so much uh, scripture this morning that I figured I might as well just put on my reading glasses and not worry about it. But anyways, thank you so much for coming, and I want to thank those who are joining us online. You are every bit as much a part of Cornerstone Fellowship as those who physically attend. So thank you for tuning in. Well, this morning we're starting a new series on the subject of racism. Now, I understand that this is a very sensitive subject. And if I'm not careful, I can cause more harm than good. And for that reason, I'm going to try, to the best of my ability, not to opine on the subject, but stick to what the Bible has to say about it. And even then, I know that I'm going to upset a lot of people, because some of you will feel like I didn't go far enough, and others of you will feel like I went too far. But I'm not going to worry about that. Instead, I'm going to let the chips fall where they may as I teach God's Word. My responsibility is to teach the truth from God's Word and not worry about whether it upsets people. And that's what I'm going to do to the best of my ability. And the reason I say to the best of my ability is because I'm human and I want to please people. But at the same time, I realize that my desire to teach the truth must outweigh my desire to please people. Now, I hope that you will extend the courtesy of listening to the entire series before you start bombarding me with emails, text messages, and messages online. To be honest with you, I don't have time during this series to be able to answer them. And I'll be honest, I'll probably answer all of your questions as we go through this series. So as I'm teaching this morning and you have a question, just hold on to it. And by the time we get to the end of the series, if I haven't answered your questions, then you can ask then and I'll probably actually go online and answer any question that a person has concerning this subject. So let's get started. On December the 6th, 1865, Eight months after the Civil War ended, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution officially ended the institution of slavery in America. But it did not end racial injustice. Though slaves were set free, they were not set free from experiencing prejudicial treatment and discrimination based on their race. Hence the term racism. Racism, by definition, is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people based on their race. Now, what's shocking to me is the fact that a nation that was founded on Christian principles would allow the institution of slavery to exist in the first place. Of course, before the United States of America declared its independence and won the war, they were a colony of England. And slavery was legal throughout the British Empire, Empire until 1807. And it wasn't entirely abolished until 1833. So slavery was legal in the American colonies, and the very first slaves that we have record of arrived at Jamestown in 1619. There are others that claim that there were some before then. But there's no record of that, so that's the official record. But when America declared its independence, it should have immediately abolished slavery because slavery violated the very core values that America was built on, Christian core values. Notice what the Declaration of Independence states. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men... are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Self-evident truths. No man has to teach you this. This is something that's self-evident if you're a believer. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and the chief one among them is liberty. In other words, freedom. Now, the truth is Christianity has come under attack by many of those who are fighting for racial equality because they believe that the Bible condones the institution of slavery, which is not true. The Bible teaches that all men are created equal 
And they've been given unalienable rights by God, their creator, with the chief one being liberty, or what we would say, freedom. So let me be very clear. God has never, ever condoned men taking away the liberty of other men. So to lay the proper foundation for the series, I must begin with the subject of slavery. Because that is the root cause of racism in America. So let me say that again. To lay the proper foundation for this series, I must begin with the subject of slavery. Now, in the ancient world, when one nation conquered another nation, they didn't move the people that they conquered away from their homeland to resettle in another land. No. Instead, they carried away everyone, men, women, and children, so that they could sell them into slavery. The only ones that they left behind were the elderly and the sick. And the only reason they left them behind was because they couldn't sell them. Now, babies were seen as a liability. So they were either killed or they were left with the elderly. And when I say killed, normally it was very, very cruel. They would grab a baby by, an infant baby by its heels, and they would sling it against a rock, bashing its head in. That's how they would do it. So in the ancient world, human trafficking was a common practice. Everyone knows what human trafficking is, right? Human trafficking is the selling of men, women, and children into slavery. And almost every nation was guilty of this. Now, there were exceptions such as the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They did things a little bit different. Instead of selling all of their prisoners of war into slavery, they would take the upper class and bring them to their country or relocate them to a foreign country. And they would leave the lower class behind and set up a puppet kingdom, making them pay tribute on an annual basis. But they didn't do this because they were compassionate. In fact, the Assyrians were very, very cruel and sadistic. Very cruel and sadistic. So they weren't doing this because they were full of mercy and they were compassionate. They did it because it was more profitable in the long run. You see, when you sold someone into slavery, you received a one-time profit. But if you made the nations you conquered pay tribute, you received an annual profit. So you came out ahead in the long run. So whenever they conquered a nation, they would take almost all of the aristocrats, the educated and the leaders, and they would relocate them to a foreign land. And the only ones they left behind were the lower class of people, the peasants, the uneducated, because they were less likely to rebel. And as I said, they would either set up a puppet king to rule over them, or they would bring in people from other conquered nations to rule over them. Now, the Assyrians did it one way, and the Babylonians did it another. But both of them carried the upper crust of society into captivity from the nations they conquered. And they left the lower class behind. Plus, they made all the nations that they conquered pay tribute. That's one of the reasons they left the lower class behind. If you remember in the Babylonian captivity, there were three phases. That's why Jeremiah kept telling them, you need to submit to this because this is God's will. If you'll submit to this, he'll deliver you in 70 years. But they wouldn't do it. So they took the first elite class. And who was among the first elite class carried into the Babylonian captivity? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel. And then they took the second phase when they didn't submit. Then they came back and they did it the third time. And boy, they devastated Israel because they didn't heed what God was saying to them through the prophet Jeremiah. But that's the way that things worked in the ancient world. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, they did things a little bit different, but I don't have time to go into that. Just know that in the ancient world, human trafficking was the norm. Slavery was practiced everywhere. And in the ancient world, with the exception of Israel, slaves were considered to be chattel. Everyone knows what chattel is, right? Chattel is an item of property other than real estate. So in the ancient world, slaves were considered to be personal property. You owned them just like you own livestock or a piece of equipment. They were yours forever unless you sold them to someone else. And if they had children, they became your slaves as well as their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. And when you died, your children would inherit them just like they would inherit property because they were, for all intents and purposes, property. And if you chose to sell their children, that was your prerogative. 
because they were your property. In fact, slavery in the ancient world was just like slavery in the antebellum South here in America. Now, does everyone know what antebellum means? I'm a good Southerner, so I pronounce it antebellum. If you're in the North, it's antebellum. But everyone knows what antebellum is, right? Antebellum refers to a period of time that occurred or existed before a particular war. In our case, the Civil War. So the antebellum South refers to that period of time in the South before the Civil War. So what I'm saying is that slavery in the ancient world was just like slavery in the antebellum South here in America. It was very cruel and very sadistic, and it was an abomination to God. And contrary to what most people think, the Bible has never, ever condoned slavery. Servanthood, yes. Slavery, no. Let me say that again. Servanthood, yes. Slavery, no. So, let's talk about slavery and what the Bible has to say about it. First of all, the Bible condemns what is known as chattel slavery. Now, everyone knows what chattel slavery is, right? I defined what chattel means. It's what we've been talking about. Chattel slavery is the enslavement of people. And those that are enslaved are considered to be the personal property of their owners. So slaves have no rights. They can be bought and sold. They can be punished as their master sees fit. They can even be put to death at the whim of the master. If you look at him wrong. He could put you to death. He could torture you. He could do whatever he wanted to. They were, for all intents and purposes, the mas- their master's property to do with them as he will. That is what is meant by chattel slavery. Now, almost every nation in the ancient world allowed chattel slavery, with one exception. Would you like to know what that one exception was? The nation of Israel. In fact, chattel slavery was just a part of the pagan nation's culture. But God forbade Israel from being like all the nations around them and having chattel slaves. It was strictly forbidden. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 16, and I'll prove it to you. Remember what the Exodus is. They're exiting Egypt. And God is getting ready to form them into the nation that he promised Abraham. They're going to be formed into a nation at Mount Sinai. So now he's giving them these laws. It starts in the very beginning when they became a nation. Here's what it says. Kidnappers must be put to death. Whether they are caught in possession of their victims or have already sold them as slaves. Let me read that again. Because this starts in the very beginning when Israel is first becoming a nation. Kidnappers must be put to death whether they are caught in possession of their victims or have already sold them as slaves. You see, back then, the whole purpose for kidnapping someone was to sell them into slavery for money or to take them as a slave for yourself. But God forbade the Israelites from doing that. If they were caught doing it, the punishment was death. Now, during the New Testament period, almost 40% of the Roman Empire were slaves. In fact, the only ones who didn't have slaves were observant Jews because God had forbidden them from having them. Now, Paul, who traveled extensively throughout the Roman Empire sharing the gospel, would have been arrested for sedition and put to death had he preached against slavery because it was such a part of their culture. And at that time, inciting slaves to rebel against their master was a capital offense in the Roman Empire. There were laws that forbid it. And anyone who did that was put to death. So Paul was very careful not to cross that line. But the message he preached was anti-slavery. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. It says, some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. See, the Bible classifies people into two groups. Jews, Gentiles. If you're not a Jew... Then you fall into the category of Gentiles. Most of us here are Gentiles. Yes. Some are slaves. And some are free. But we have all, Gentiles and slaves, been baptized into one body by one spirit. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit immerses your spirit into the body of Christ. You're joined with Him and you have become one spirit with Him. Then it goes further. 
And we all share the same spirit. What spirit is that? The Holy Spirit. Yes, for the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells within us. The Holy Spirit. In other words, we are all children of God. And we're all members of Christ's body. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is what Paul is teaching. He's teaching to a pagan, uh, pagan nations, who's all part of the Roman Empire, that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. And we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, this is new. This is new to all these Gentiles, these pagans. They've never been taught that. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8 through 9. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do. You see, we're not going to be punished for the bad things we did if we're believers because Jesus Christ took our punishment upon himself. He paid the penalty for our sin. So when we stand before the Bema seat of Christ, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not to be punished for the bad things that we did in our body. Christ already took that. Now remember, he's talking to believers, not non-believers. But what about the good we've done? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Remember, the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do. We're saved by grace, but rewarded by works. Some of you forget that. Heaven's not socialistic. We're not all going to receive the same rewards. Those who did what God has called us to do on this earth are going to be rewarded. Yes. Then he goes further. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Why did he say that? Because 40% of all the people within the Roman Empire were slaves. Yeah. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. He can't just come out and say it. He'll be accused of sedition and put to death. So he sneaks around the corner. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. In other words, you treat them the way God treats you. And keep in mind, God doesn't make a distinction between a slave and a free man, so you shouldn't either. Ooh. He might as well have said, you can't be a Christian and have slaves. Now, in the book of 1 Timothy, Paul took it a step further. And he condemned slavery. Yes, he actually came out and condemned slavery at a time when the whole world practiced slavery with the exception of Israel. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It's for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who killed their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality. He makes a distinction. After this series, I'm going to teach on the five categories of sin. Not all sin is the same. And if you grew up Southern Baptist, you've been taught that, but you've been taught wrong. Let's keep going. The laws for people who are sexually immoral, who practice homosexuality, or are slave traders. Or who are slave traders. Liars. In the original Greek, that means liars for profit. You know, we have these jokes about used car salesmen. But anyways, basically, liars for profit. Promise breakers. Or who do anything else that, now notice this or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching of God. Now, everything on this list is condemned by Paul and is said to contradict what the Word of God teaches. Let me say that again. Everything in this list is condemned by Paul, and he says that it contradicts what the Word of God teaches. Do you see that? Good. 
Now, the phrase slave traders is translated from the Greek word andrapodistes, and it means to steal or take away another man's freedom. Yeah. So it can refer to a slave owner or a slave trader. There is no distinction. Because the slave owner is just as bad as the slave trader. Both are guilty of stealing another man's freedom, of taking away another man's freedom. So what this is saying is that being a slave owner contradicts the Word of God. Ooh. What Paul said is being a slave owner or a slave trader contradicts what the Bible teaches. Listen to me. You cannot say you're a Christian and own slaves. That's what Paul was saying. You can't say you're a Christian and you abide by the Word of God and own slaves. So don't tell me that the Bible condones slavery because it doesn't. But it does condone servanthood, or what we would call indentured servants, which is totally different than slavery. And as we go through the Bible this morning and next week, because this is so important, you'll see the difference, and it's a huge difference. So let's look to see what the Bible has to say about indentured servants. Now, in an ideal world, servanthood would neither be an option or necessity. But we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world that has poverty as a result of sin. And poverty was the sole reason that God allowed servanthood. It was a means to help the poor to survive. So in Israel, a person could sell himself into servanthood. In other words, he could become an indentured servant in order to pay off his debt or to provide room and board for himself until he could get back on his feet. Let me say that again. In Israel, a person could sell himself into servanthood. He could become an indentured servant in order to pay off his debt or to provide room and board for himself until he could get back on his feet. You see, God never intended for Israel to have poverty, but sin made it inevitable, so God allowed indentured servitude to deal with that reality. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Moses is writing this. He's restating a lot of it because they're getting ready to go into the promised land. But Deuteronomy, and most people don't realize this, is actually setting up what is known as Deuteronomistic history. What he's telling them in the book of Deuteronomy is if you keep the law, you'll be blessed. If you don't keep the law, you'll be cursed. So now as we go through history, we see when we came to the period of the judges, every time they didn't keep the law and they did what was right in their own eyes, guess what? People would come in, invade the land, and God would have to raise up a judge to deliver Israel. And then when they finally get to the period of the kings, we find out if there was a good king, they were blessed. If there was an evil king, they were cursed. But the main thing was if they didn't keep the law, they were cursed. That's the whole purpose of Deuteronomy. It's not just repeating all of this. It's setting up this concept so you understand what's going to happen in the Bible till we get to the point where we say, dang it, none of us can keep it. We need a Messiah. Yeah. Here's Deuteronomy 15 verses 4 through 5. Sorry for going off on a tangent. There should be no poor among you. Wow. God said there should be no poor among you for your, the Lord your God will greatly bless you in the land He is giving you as a special possession. You will receive this blessing if you are careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. But of course, they didn't obey all of the commands that God gave them, so there were poor people living among them. Now, becoming an indentured servant in order to pay off debt was a last resort. In fact, God enacted several laws to prevent the need to do that. God did not want people selling themselves into indentured servitude. He didn't want that. That was the last resort. So he enacted certain laws to help the poor. And most of these laws are found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 24. In fact, if I was taking notes, if I were you, I would write down Deuteronomy chapter 24, the laws that God enacted in order to keep the people from having to sell themselves into indentured servitude. In verse 6, you could not take a piece of equipment that a family needed for survival as a pledge for a loan. Notice what verse 6 says. 
It is wrong to take a set of millstones or even just the upper millstone as security for a loan for the owner using it to make a living. And this didn't just apply to millstones. It applied to any piece of equipment or even livestock that a man needed to make a living. So if a person came to you and wanted a loan, you said, well, what collateral do you have? I I really don't have any collateral. That's why I need a loan. Then they would look and see what you had and say, I'll take that as a pledge. But what God says is, you can't take any piece of equipment or even livestock, such as ox, if you're a farmer for people, or you're clearing land. You can't take that because that's how they make their living. Not only that, but a poor man's coat, given as a pledge, could not be kept overnight so that that man wouldn't get cold. Look at verse 12. If your neighbor is poor and gives you his cloak as security for a loan, do not keep the cloak overnight. Now basically this is just stating a principle that you don't take things away from the poor that's going to cause hardship for them. That's going to put them in a position that they don't know how they're going to make it. If someone was poor, you had to pay them for their work on a daily basis because they might need that money to eat. They're they're literally living from day to day. Many of you still do that. Someone comes and cleans your house, you leave the money for them that day. Someone comes in and mows your yard, you give them that money that day. Sometimes you do it uh, on a monthly basis, but do you know how that started? It started because the Word of God says you pay them on a day-to-day basis because their kids might not eat if you don't pay them every day. Look at verses 14 and 15. This is still Deuteronomy 24. Never take advantage of poor and destitute laborers, whether they are fellow Israelites or foreigners living in your town. It doesn't matter. We're all created by God. And endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. You must pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and they're counting on it. If you don't, they might cry out to the Lord against you. They might say, God, we don't have anything to eat. I worked for so and so, but he didn't pay me today. He's making me wait. And it would be counted against you as sin. When harvesting wheat, olives, grapes, or any crop, some had to be intensely left behind for the poor. Look at verses 19 through 21. When you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. When you beat the olives from your olive trees, don't go over the boughs twice. Leave the remaining olives for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. When you gather the grapes in your vineyard, don't glean the vines after they are picked. Leave the remaining grapes for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. It's one of the reasons we say that we need to be generous. This did not exclude the tithe. They went ahead and gave the tithe. This is on top of the tithe. We're generous to help those others. So we give offering on top. So, Becoming an indentured servant was a last resort. Let me say it again. You had all of these laws that were enacted to help the poor, but every once in a while, that still wasn't enough. So becoming an indentured servant was a last resort, but sometimes it was necessary. You see, sometimes circumstances got so bad that a person felt that they had to become an indentured servant in order to survive. Or he had debt that he couldn't repay. And he couldn't figure out any way to be able to get ahead and pay off his debt. So he would agree to become an indentured servant to the man he owed money to as a method of repayment. Or if he owed money to several people, he would agree to become an indentured servant to a rich man in return for that rich man paying off all the different people that he owed. But here's the kicker. You could never agree to work as an indentured servant for more than six years. You could never agree to become an indentured servant for more than six years. In other words, indentured servanthood came with an expiration date, six years. Look at Exodus chapter 21, verse number two. Now remember, in Exodus, they're forming this nation. They're coming out as a people. They went down as one family. Jacob, 12 sons, 11 sons, one's already down there. 
and the rest of their family, 70 in all. And they come out a great nation. And God is establishing this nation. And at the very beginning, notice what he says because he realized they won't be able to keep the law. Sin will come in. Part of the curse of sin is poverty. So here's what he says. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he may serve for no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. This command is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse number 12. Because remember, in Deuteronomy, they're not just repeating this. They're saying, if you don't keep these commands. So he's repeating these things. And when it's repeated in one place, Exodus, and it's repeated, or, or it's stated in Exodus, it's repeated in Deuteronomy, it means it's important. Notice what it says. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years, in the seventh year, you must set that servant free. And after the sixth year, you couldn't just set them free. It wasn't good enough to say, okay, you paid off your debt, go ahead. No. First, you had to forgive them of all debt. That's why they were set free. Their debt was completely canceled. Because if it wasn't completely canceled, then they're going to have to sell themselves right back into it. So you understood that if someone became your indentured servant, it was for six years. It didn't matter how much they owed you. It's canceled at the end of six years. Secondly, not only did you set them free, but you had to stake them. You had to send them out with a liberal supply of grain, wine, and livestock. So when they went back to their family land, they had something to plant and enough to live on until the harvest came. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years, in the seventh year you must set that servant free. When you release a male servant, do not send him away empty-handed. Now why does it say male? Because if he's married or he has daughters... You don't have to give each one of them. You're just going to give the head of the family. Do not send him away empty-handed. Give him a generous farewell gift from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Share with him some of the bounty with which the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this command. You should remember how it was for you. You know, I really believe this. I, th I believe that everyone should be poor at least once in their lifetime. You know, when Lisa and I got married, we were poor. And we built ourselves up to the point where, whoo, this is looking good. And then God said, sell the jewelry stores, sell the gyms, go into the ministry, Whew, right back to poor. But let me tell you something. Being poor teaches you. It teaches you humility. It gives you empathy. And you understand God in a whole new way. And I know parents, sometimes you don't want your kids to be poor. And you want to help them. So when they get married, you give them all this stuff. You help them out when they're in need. But you're really doing them a disservice. In my generation, my parents had five kids. They couldn't do that. They had one that was a trouble kid they were always spending money on. They didn't have any money for us. I didn't even think about going to my parents. But let me tell you, the best years, at least in my marriage, was when we were poor. And you know, when my kids got out of college, there would come times I, I just didn't want them to have to go through things I did. But there were times God would say, don't even offer till they come to you. And they wouldn't come to me. And you know, they were poor. And I'd say, God, I think I'm going to say, well, just let them be poor a little bit. They need to know what it's like. <gasps> To be poor. Sorry. Now, if you sold yourself as an indentured servant, you still retained all of the rights of a free man. Let me say that again. 
Israel was totally different from all the pagan nations around them because if you sowed yourself into indentured servitude, you still retained all the rights of a free man. Something that was unheard of in any other pagan nation. In other words, the civil laws applied to servants as well as it did free men. Every one of the civil laws. No Jim Crow laws. There was no separate but equal. There was no you can't do this. No, 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 no. All of the civil laws applied to servants just as they did free men in the very same way. Yeah. And they were allowed to participate in all of the religious rites, including Passover. Look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 through 44. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money. When thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. And all servants were to be circumcised if they were foreigners and had not been circumcised. Now, why in the world were they required to be circumcised and then you're supposed to allow them to eat the Passover? Because what we're going to find out is when you sowed yourself into your servants, you became part of the family to which you sowed yourself to. And the Passover is for each family. So if you had an indentured servant, they're part of the family. We're going to see that in just a minute. Notice what Genesis chapter 17 verse 13 says. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought. In other words, those who are your children or your relatives. And he that is bought with thy money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Why must they be circumcised? Why, if you bought an, a, someone who was a foreigner and they came to you and is, they're going to be an indentured servant, they sell themselves to you, why in the world must they be circumcised? Because they're considered to be part of your family by God. And you're to treat them as if they're family. And God says that your family has to be circumcised. So if you had a foreigner or even a Hebrew that had not been circumcised, and they came to you and said, you know, I just can't make it. I'm willing to sell myself as an indentured servant. You know what you'd say? Are you circumcised? If they said no, you'd say, well, you can't be mine unless you're willing to be circumcised. Why? Because God will consider you part of my family and blessings will not come upon me. We'll be cut off unless you're circumcised. It also included the observance of the Sabbath. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. Your family. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, even your livestock because God is good to animals. And any foreigners living among you. And he continues on. It also included the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 10 through 11. Then, se then celebrate the Feast of Weeks to honor the Lord your God. Bring him a voluntary offering in proportion of the blessings you have received from him. This is a time to celebrate before the Lord your God at the designated place of worship. He will choose for his name to be honored. Celebrate with your sons and daughters, your male and female servants. These feasts were only for the Jews and their family. Do you know what this is telling us? You know what you should infer from this? They're to be treated like family. We're going to see it in just a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 13 through 14 is observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Don't have time to read it. I just want you to understand this. From God's perspective, an indentured servant was considered to be part of the family. Let me say that again. From God's perspective, for the nation of Israel, an indentured servant was considered to be a part of the family. Look at Leviticus chapter 22, verse number 11, and I'm going to prove it to you. This is proof. Notice what it says. However, if the priest buys a servant for himself, the servant may eat from the sacred offerings. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are the sacred offerings? The offerings that have been given to the priest from the altar in the temple. The only ones who are allowed to eat from this are priests. Only a family member of a priest could do that. 
So when he says, however, the priest buys it himself, the servant may eat from the sacred arms, and if his slaves have children, they may also share his food. Why? Because from God's perspective. Now, anyone else that eats from it, anyone else who eats from it, God's going to cut them off. Because the sacred offerings is only for the priest and his family. But when he buys a servant, you know what it says? They get to eat thereof. Because from God's perspective, they're part of the family. The truth is, as an indentured servant, you had special considerations. I don't have time to read it, but let me give you the scripture. You can go back and read it. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 35 through 43. Now, let me show you the verse that proves that indentured servants in Israel were not considered to be slaves, chattel slaves. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 15 through 16. You need to write this verse down, highlight it in your Bible, because if you get in a de debate with a person that says, well, the Bible condones slavery, you need to turn to this verse. Here's what it says. If slaves should escape from their masters and take refuge with you, you must not hand them over to their masters. Let them live among you in any town they choose and do not oppress them. This applied to foreign slaves and to those in Israel who became indentured servants. If they wanted their freedom, all they had to do was run away to a different city. In fact, there were many rabbis that said it didn't even have to be another city. All you had to do is run across the street. And all you had to say is, I'm running away from my master. And they were not forced to go back. Do you see that? They're not considered property. Why? Because any time they don't want to serve anymore, all they have to do is run away from their master. And everyone in Israel is supposed to protect them and say, they are not chattel. They are human beings and children of God. They don't turn them in. They don't oppress them. They protect them. Listen to me. The Bible does not condone chattel slavery, and it never has. Ever. Human trafficking is an abomination to God. Now, someday I'll talk about concubines and liver at marriage and explain how that worked and why. Because God set up things that many times in our culture we go, I don't understand it. But when you go back and understand that, it makes all, it makes all the difference in the world. It makes sense. Now, this is just part one. We've just really scratched the surface. I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has never, ever condoned slavery. So this is slavery in the Bible, part one. Next week will be slavery in the Bible, part two. But here's the takeaway from this morning. All men are created equal. This is self-evident. The Bible even teaches that. All men are created equal equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and the chief one among them being liberty and any man that takes away the liberty of any other man in the old testament was to be put to death in the new testament they have contradicted everything the bible teaches that's why i'm aghast that america even had that because they tried to set up America on Christian principles, but in this one area, they compromised. Now let me ask you, is there an area in your life that you know is wrong, but because of some reason, you justify it, you allow it? Let me tell you, it will create the most hardship and the most heartache in your life if you don't do what God says. Now, last week I talked about slavery. And I made the comment that I'm shocked that our founding fathers did not abolish slavery when they declared our independence. Because slavery violated the very core principles, the very core values that our nation was built on. Christian core values. And that was and is a blight on America's founding father's legacy. 
Now, because the majority of our founding fathers were Christians and established our nation on Judeo-Christian principles, their failure to abolish slavery became a black eye upon all Christianity. In fact, Christianity has come, upon, has come under attack by many of those who are fighting for racial in, uh, equality because they believe that the Bible condones the institution of slavery, which is not true. The Bible clearly teaches that all men are created equal by God and they're endowed with certain unalienable rights. You know what unalienable means, right? It means it can't be taken away because God gave them to you. Now, today we say inalienable, but the reason I say inalienable is because that's the way it was written in our Declaration of Independence. But I want you to understand the Bible clearly teaches that all men are created by God and endowed with certain and alienable rights, with the chief one being liberty, which means freedom. So let me be very clear. God has never, ever condoned men taking away the liberty of others. Now, last week, I wanted to lay the foundation for this series by addressing the subject of slavery. And this morning, I'm going to continue on the topic of slavery. So this morning's message, even though it's part of the series, Racism in the Bible, is titled Slavery in the Bible, Part 2. But before we jump into this morning's message, let me briefly review what we covered last week, starting with chattel slavery. As I told you, chattel slavery is an abomination unto God. It always has been, and it always will be. But almost every nation in the ancient world allowed it, with the exception of Israel. Every, everyone remembers what chattel slavery is, right? Chattel slavery is the enslavement of people. And those that are enslaved are considered to be the personal property of their owners. So the slaves have no rights. They can be bought and sold. They can be punished however their master sees fit. They can even be put to death at the whim of the master. They are, for all intents and purposes, the master's property to do with them as he wills. That's what we mean by chattel slavery. But God forbade Israel from being like all the pagan nations around them and having chattel slaves. It was strictly forbidden. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus chapter 21, verse number 16, and I'll prove it to you. Notice what it says. Kidnappers must be put to death whether they are caught in possession of their victims or have already sold them as slaves. Now, I want you to notice the word already. The word already implies the purpose for kidnapping. You see, back then, the whole reason you kidnapped someone is so that you could sell them into slavery for money or keep them for yourselves as a slave. That's the only two reasons you would do it. But God forbade the Israelites from doing that, and if they were caught doing it, they were put to death. That was the punishment. Now, there are those that claim that the Mosaic law allowed the Israelites to allow slaves. But people, that's not true. However, the Mosaic law did allow the Israelites to have indentured servants, which is totally different than slavery. Everyone knows what the word indentured means, right? An indenture is a legal agreement or contract. So an indentured servant is someone who's entered into a legal agreement They've entered into a contract to be a laborer in exchange for their debt being paid off and being provided with room and board. In fact, if you study American history, many of the people, the, the immigrants that came to America, they came as indentured servants. They could not pay for their way coming to America, so they found someone who could pay for it that was coming to America, and they said, if you'll buy my ticket, I will work for you for X amount of years so that, so that I can get to America, and then I'm set free. So we know all about indentured servants if we study American history. But they had indentured servants back then. Yeah. Now, in Israel, becoming an indentured servant was a last resort. But sometimes it was necessary. You see, sometimes circumstances got so bad that a person felt that they had to become an indentured servant in order to survive. Or they had a debt they couldn't repay. So they would agree to become an indentured servant to the man they owed money to as a method of repayment. Or if they owed money to several people, they would try to find someone who was rich, who would pay off all their debts to all these people if they became an indentured servant to them. 
But they could never agree to work as an indentured servant for more than six years. In other words, indentured servanthood came with an expiration date of six years. Look at Exodus chapter 21, verse 2. If you buy a Hebrew slave... He may serve for no more, see that, no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. This command is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse number 12. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years in the seventh year, you must set that servant free. And after the sixth year, You couldn't just set them free. First, you had to forgive them for all of their debt. That's why they were set free. Their debt was completely canceled. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. At the end of every seventh year, you must cancel the debts of everyone who owes you money. This is how it must be done. Everyone must cancel the loans they have made to their fellow Israelites. They must not demand payment from their neighbors or relatives, for the Lord's time of release has arrived. Now, I didn't give you that scripture last week, so I just wanted to make sure that you had it. So you'd have that in your arsenal when you're talking with someone about the subject. Secondly, you had to stake them. In other words, you couldn't just send them out with nothing, but you had to send them out with a liberal supply of grain, wine, and livestock. So when they went back to their family land, they had something to plant and something to live on until the first harvest came. You'll find that in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. We're not going to read it because we read it last week. Now, if you sowed yourself as an indentured servant, you still retained all the rights of a free man. Let me say that again because that's important. If you sowed yourself as an indentured servant, you still retained all the rights of a free man. Something that was unheard of with the pagan nations that surrounded Israel and all of the other nations in the ancient world. In other words, the civil laws applied to servants as well as it did to free men. And they were allowed to participate in all of the religious rites. Now, let me show you the verse that proves that indentured servants in Israel were not considered to be slaves. Look with me, if you would, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 15 through 16. If slaves should escape from their masters... And take refuge with you. You must not hand them over to the masters. Let them live among you in any town they choose. And do not oppress them. Now people, this applied to foreign slaves. And to those in Israel who became indentured servants. If they wanted their freedom, all they had to do was to run away. And go to a different city. And they were never forced to go back. Ever. Under any circumstances. If their owner went to get them... It was considered kidnapping. And what's the punishment for kidnapping? Death. Now, there are some rabbis, in fact, there's two two, uh, trains of thought on this. Some rabbis said you had to run to a different city. But you had uh, other rabbis who said, no, you could even stay in the same city because it says any city you want to live in. And so they taught that you could just run across the street and say, I don't want to be an indentured servant anymore. I don't want to be a slave to him anymore. And as a result of that, he could take refuge. That's all he had to say. I'm taking refuge. I don't want to be under the master anymore. And they couldn't come get you. There's not a thing they could do about it. Yeah. Other rabbis said, no, it implies you couldn't stay in the same city because that would create problems. Therefore, you had to run to any other city you wanted to, but the master had no right to come and get you. Ever. So, listen to me. The Bible does not condone chattel slavery, and it never has. Ever. Human trafficking is an abomination unto God. Now, there are two scriptures that I need to share with you that I didn't get to last week because of time. But they're very important. And if I don't explain them, it could cause some major confusion if you run across them. And these are the scriptures people use to email me. They just couldn't wait until I finished the series. And so here it came. And I had to say, I couldn't get to it. I'm going to get to those scriptures next week. So let me share these scriptures with you and clear up some of the misconceptions that many of you have. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Leviticus chapter 25. 
We're going to read verses 35 through 43. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and cannot support himself, support him as you would a foreigner or a temporary resident and allow him to live with you, room and board. Do not charge interest or make a profit at his expense. Instead, in other words, don't charge him for living with you. Let him live with you. Show your fear of God by letting him live with you as your relative. In other words, treat him like he's family. Remember, do not charge interest on money you lend him or make a profit on food that you sell him. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell himself to you, do not treat him as a slave. Do not treat him as a slave. Treat him instead as a hired worker or as a temporary resident who lives with you, and he will serve you only until the year of Jubilee. At that time, he and his children will no longer be obligated to you, and they will return to their clans and go back to the land originally allotted to their ancestors. The people of Israel are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, so they must never be sold as slaves. Show your fear of God by not treating them harshly. Now, this is the one exception to the six-year expiration date for indentured servants. In other words, this is the one exception to an indentured servant being set free after working for six years. But to understand this, this exception, you have to understand the year of Jubilee. So turn with me again, same chapter, Leviticus 25, but turn to verses 8 through 10, and I'll explain what the year of Jubilee is. In addition, you must count off Seven Sabbath years. How many knows what a Sabbath year is? Seven years. So you count off seven seven-year periods. That's how long? 49 years. All right? Adding up to 49 years in all. Then on the Day of Atonement in the 50th year, blow the ram's horn loud and long through the land. Now if you remember, after you finish your sixth year, on the first day you're set free. But here in the year of Jubilee, it says not until... Yom Kippur, why? Because the first of the year is Tishri the first, Rosh Hashanah. That's the new year. But then you have something called the 10 days of awe where you're preparing yourself for Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement. So you're set free there, but you don't want to be released to your land because now you have to prepare for Yom Kippur where God forgives all the sins of Israel and everyone is set free and all debt is canceled. All right, just wanted you to know that. Set this year apart as holy, a time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. It will be a jubilee year for you when each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors and return to your own clan. Now, jump down to verses 23 through 28, same chapter. The land must never be sold on a permanent basis, for the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. So when God allotted the land, when they came into the promised land, and he allotted the land to each family from each tribe, each tribe had a certain section of land, and each family in that tribe was allotted so much land. When they were allotted that land, they were not to sell it on a permanent basis. Why? Because the land didn't belong to them. The land belonged to God. That's an interesting principle. That principle of the tithing. Let me just say this. You think the money belongs to you, but it doesn't. It belongs to God. But God is just gracious enough to you to say that you can live on 90% of it. Just do whatever you want with 90%. But 10%, you give back to me. Why? Because it shows that you understand that I gave you this earth. I gave you the air you breathe. The health that you enjoy, everything that you have, it comes from me. And don't you ever forget that. Yeah. So let's keep going. You're only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. With every purchase of land, you must grant the seller the right to buy it back. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell some family land, then a close relative should buy it back for him. Kinsman Redeemer, you've heard of it. If there is no close relative to buy the land, but the person who sold it gets enough money to buy it back, he then has the right to redeem it from the one who bought it. The price of the land will be discounted according to the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. 
And this way, the original owner can then return to the land. But if the original owner cannot afford to buy back the land, it will remain with the new owner until the next year of Jubilee. And the Jubilee year, the land must be returned to the original owners so they can return to their family land. Every 49 years, you came to the 50th year, Tishri the first. You have 10 days of all on Yom Kippur. Everything's canceled. Everyone's land goes back to them. It doesn't matter how much you sold it for. It's yours again. So on the year of Jubilee, all debt was forgiven and any land in your family that had been sold returned to your family. So in essence, you never really sold your land. Instead, it was leased from you until the year of Jubilee. In fact, that's how you would determine how much you're going to buy the land for. If Randall wanted to sell me his land, I would count to, well, there's 23 more years into the year of Jubilee. That means I'm going to get 23 harvest. In 23 harvest, I can make this much money. Okay, what am I willing to sell him the land for? And so, or buy the land from him for? And so I would come to him and I would say, I'm going to buy it for this much money. But I'm really just leasing it. Because when the year of Jubilee runs around or comes around 23 years later, it's 50 years always, but you might be somewhere in between that period. Because it was always the same for everyone, the year of Jubilee. So as a result of that, I would come in and lease the land for that. He has the right to redeem it back at any time. Pay me back. But if he doesn't, at the end of the year of Jub or at the end of that 49 year period when the 50th year starts it's going back to him yeah all land was returned to the original owner this kept the land that was allotted to each tribe to remain with, within the tribe and with the family that the land was originally allotted to so no matter how poor your family was, on the first day in the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled. And the land that was originally allotted to your family was returned to you on Yom Kippur, 10 days later. So you, along with everyone in Israel, had a chance to start over with a clean slate. Now, let me explain what this has to do with indentured servants. Because you say, Pastor, you were talking about slavery, I got it. You were talking about indentured servants. I got it. What in the world does the year of Jubilee have to do with that? Well, as I've stated several times, under the Mosaic law, indentured servitude came with an expiration date of six years. Unless, unless you had no family land to go back to. And the only reason you wouldn't have any family land to go back to would have been because you sold it to pay off multiple debts. You see, if you owed one person and you couldn't pay them what you owed, you could keep your land and become an indentured servant to them for six years. And after that six years, you could go back to your land. Now your debt's been paid for. But if you owed money to multiple people, the only thing that you could really do was sell your land knowing that it would be returned to your family in the year of Jubilee. And then you would take the money to pay off everyone you owed money to. But guess what? Now you don't have any land to make a living. So to survive, you became an indentured servant. And it wouldn't do any good to be set free in six years or after six years because you still didn't have any land to make a living. Your land would not be returned to you until the year of Jubilee. And as a result of that, you had no land to make a living. You see, 96% of Israel's economy was agriculture. In other words, 96%, and they're talking about Old Testament period, 96% of the people in ancient Israel were farmers who raised livestock. If you didn't have any land, you couldn't farm. You couldn't raise livestock. Yeah. So if you didn't own land, all you could do was be a day laborer. And a day laborer's work was seasonal. Think of migrant workers. The migrant workers that go up through California. They come up when it's harvest season. So they come in, they harvest this, and they go to the next one, they harvest this, and they go to the next one, they harvest it. But when the season is over, they go home. Why do they go home? 
because the work is seasonal. If you want to make your living working, not owning, but working for someone who is uh, in the canoe business on the Illinois River, you're going to have work in the summertime, late spring, early fall. But after that, you're not going to have any work. You better make enough money to be able to survive. And probably just working out there, you won't make enough money. And that was the problem. If you didn't own your own land, you had to be a day laborer and the work was seasonal. So you couldn't survive. So to be set free after six years didn't do you any good. And that's why you had an exception to the six-year ex expiration date for indentured servants. It would have been cruel to let them go without any way for them to make a living. So if an indentured servant sold his family's land, you could not force him to leave after six years. In fact, you couldn't force him to leave until the year of Jubilee when the land that was allotted to his family was returned to him. But if he still owned the land allotted to his family, then you had to let him go after six years, debt-free, and with enough supplies to get him started. So, always remember that there's a six-year limitation unless they sold their land. And then it would be cruel to do that, so they remained an indentured servant until the next year of Jubilee when their land would be returned to them. That's what you need to understand. Now, let's look and see what the Mosaic Law said about indentured servants who were foreigners, not Israelites. First of all, I want you to know that foreigners were protected under the Mosaic Law in that they had the very same rights as a Jew, with a few exceptions. And I'll explain the exceptions. In fact, foreigners were supposed to receive equal treatment before the law. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse number 1. And I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly, whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. In other words, you don't favor Israelites over foreigners when it comes to the law. Justice is blind. Where do you think America got that? We're the most just nation in the world. We haven't always been. That's why I'm teaching on this. But you don't want to know where we got justice is blind? In fact, the symbol is Lady Liberty out there. She's weighing it, but she's blindfolded. We got it here. Yeah. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 17. True justice must be given to foreigners living among you and to orphans. Yeah. In other words, you can't be biased against foreigners. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 19. Cursed is anyone who denies justice to foreigners, orphans, or widows. And all the people will reply, amen. Yeah. In other words, if you really want to tick God off, if you really want to make God, make God angry, then you show partiality to Israelites and you deny foreigners justice. Because justice is supposed to be blind. But here's the bottom line as it pertains to the law and foreigners. Look with me, if you would, in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 22. This is a verse every one of you should write in your Bible. Here's what it says. You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. In other words, the Israelites. I am the Lord your God. Let me say that again. You are to have the same law. For the foreigner and the native born. Leviticus 24, 22. In other words, you don't have one set of law for Israelites and another set of laws for the foreigners. It's the same standard for everyone. Does that make sense? Good. However, there were a few exceptions. But the exceptions were for the protection of foreigners, not for their harm. Let me say this again. The only reason there's exceptions is because these exceptions are for the protection of the foreigner, not for his harm. So when I say exceptions, people go, oh yeah, there it is. No, 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 no. The exceptions is to protect the foreigner and not harm him. So knowing that, look at Leviticus chapter 25, verses 39 through 46. And if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. 
as a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and you shall, and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your God. And as for your male and female slaves, whom you may have from the nations around you. Okay, what about the servants who are foreigners? From them you may buy males and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land. And they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you. To inherit them as a possession, they shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. Now, before I explain why God allowed the Israelites to keep foreign servants perpetually, let me remind you of something. If any slave, whether he was an indentured servant from Israel, a Jew, or a slave purchased in another land, if any slave wanted his freedom, all he had to do was run away. Leviticus 24, 22. All he had to do was run to another city within Israel. In fact, there is nothing in the Mosaic law that prohibited any type of slave from running away. And if they did run away, they were not to be returned under any circumstances to their master. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. Look at it again. If slaves should escape from their masters and take refuge with you, you must not hand them over to their masters. Let them live among you in any town they choose and do not oppress them. So if a slave wanted his freedom, all he had to do was run away. And he could not be returned. Plus... He could live in any city within Israel he desired to. So, why did God allow the Israelites to keep foreign servants perpetually? In other words, why weren't they released after six years like Jewish servants? And why weren't they set free when the year of Jubilee rode around? And why were they inherited as property from one generation to the next? Does anyone know? Because it sure sounds like there's a double standard when it comes to Jews and Gentiles. And Leviticus 24, 22 said there wasn't supposed to be a double standard. Notice what Leviticus 24, 22 says. Let's read it again. You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord your God. So what's the deal? Does anyone know? Well, here's the answer. Foreigners could not own land in Israel. If you remember, when they came in the promised land, all of the land was allotted to the Israelites when they came in. And if they had to sell it, it was not to be sold on a permanent basis. In fact, in the year of Jubilee, it was returned to the family that it was originally allotted to. So foreigners never owned land in Israel. Yeah. So if you set a foreign servant free after six years or in the year of Jubilee, they had no place to go. The best they could do was to become a day laborer, which was seasonal work. So it was to their advantage to stay in the position of a servant. In fact, you always need to remember this. If you're taking notes, write this down. In Israel, slavery was meant to help the poor. But if a slave thought he could do better, all he had to do was leave. Yeah. Yeah. That's all he had to do. All they had to do is run away. Seek refuge in another city. So here's what I want you to understand. Chattel slavery was and is an abomination to God. God never condoned it. He allowed people to sell themselves as indentured servants, but it was always for their good and never for their harm. And he always told the masters the same set of laws that applies to the free men applies to them. And you're to treat them like a relative. They're to live with you like a relative. And most people don't understand that. Now, why is it important to know this? And I spent two weeks on this before we, before we were ever getting to the subject of racism in America. 
Why in the world is this important? Well, it's important because today Christianity is under attack by liberals. You see, the best way to silence Christians on the issues like abortion and homosexuality is to attack the Bible. And the way they attack the Bible is by, claim, is by claiming that it condones immoral and unjust practices. Therefore, it can't be used as the moral authority on today's issues. I can't tell you how many times I've heard liberals make comments like this. Oh, that's really good. Use the Bible. The Bible condemns homosexuality, but it condones slavery. So by all means, let's use the Bible as the moral authority on today's issues. And the sarcasm's just dripping off. And most people don't know their Bibles. So what do Christians do when they hear that? They shut up. But again, that's because most Christians really don't know what the Bible actually teaches. I read something the other day. And it was just mind-blowing. Do you realize that less than 10% of Christians have ever actually read the entire Bible? I don't mean in a year. I mean in their whole life. Less than 10% of Christians have actually read the entire Bible. That blew me away. The only Bible Christians know is the Bible that's taught to them For one hour, one day of the week. And most pastors get up and they preach the same thing over and over again, just a different way. Salvation, they're not a teaching ministry. So people have no idea what the Bible really teaches. They've just gleaned little verses from other people. And they've gleaned a lot on Facebook memes, yeah. So most Christians don't know how to defend the Bible. And people, we're supposed to be able to defend the Bible. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. And I'm telling you, people are reviling our good conduct today. But do you see that word defense? Always be ready to give a defense. That word defense is translated from the Greek word apologia, and it means to defend. In fact, our English word apologetics is transliterated from this Greek word. Apologetics is the area of Christian theology that aims to intelligently defend the Christian faith. Now, let me just tell you, the attacks on Christianity and the Bible are going to get worse. So you better be able to defend the Bible if you want to be able to use it as the moral authority in today's culture. Barna came out and said that less than 2% of millennials believe that the Bible is the moral authority. The standard by which we live. Of course, it said it a little bit different. So less than 2% of, uh, of millennials Believe in a biblical worldview. In a biblical worldview, let me just tell you what a biblical worldview is. A biblical worldview is that you believe that this is the inspired word of God and that it is the moral authority by which to live your life by. And you know what's interesting? When I was growing up, even people who didn't go to church would say, yeah, the Bible, it's the word of God. Well, the Bible condemns that. And they didn't even go to church. They weren't even saved. But it's because the majority of people had A biblical world view. Today, that's not true. Less than 2% of millennials believe that. And you want to know why they don't believe that the Bible is inspired and it is the moral authority that we're supposed to live by? It's because they've been taught that the Bible condones immoral practices, unjust practices. It condones slavery. It condones these wicked things. And then it turns around and tells you, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't live by the Bible. People, it's important. Now, I don't expect you to be able to memorize all these verses I've given you. Let's be honest. I'm paid to study the Bible. Thank you for doing that. But you do need to know what the Bible teaches. And if you get into that, 
uh, debate with someone and Facebook's not a place for debate? You say, you know what? You really need to listen to my pastor. He taught a series entitled Racism in the Bible. He'll answer those questions and he'll show you that's not true. But here's what I want you to get out of today's message. God has never, ever condoned chattel slavery. And the problems our nation is experiencing today with racial, un racial unrest is because our founding fathers violated the very core values that our nation was built on. Christian core values. They violated these values by allowing chattel slavery to exist. And as a result of that, we're seeing riots in our streets. We're seeing bias on both ways. So next week, I'm going to deal with what the Bible has to say about racism. Because let me tell you what most people do. They go to one of two extremes. Something happens and they either swing way out here to this extreme or they swing way out here to this extreme. And you know where truth, truth lies? Truth lies right here in the middle. Balance. And I'm going to show you what the Word of God says. And if we would practice the Word of God, you would not see racism. What is the answer for America? Jesus Christ. Now, the first two sermons of this series were all about slavery in America and how it violated the very core values that our nation was built upon. Christian core values. You see, the majority of our founding fathers were Christians. And they established our nation on Judeo-Christian principles. So their failure to abolish slavery became a black eye on all of Christianity. And even worse, it gave the impression that the Bible condones the practice of slavery, which is not true. In fact, the Bible clearly teaches that all men are created equal by God and endowed with certain unalienable rights, with the chief one being liberty, which of course is freedom. So let me be very clear. God has never ever condoned the practice of slavery it is an abomination to him so as you can see our nation's history has a repugnant past especially as it pertains to slavery and racism and if that wasn't bad enough much of the guilt lies at the feet of our churches you see many of the churches in america especially in the south distorted the scriptures in order to justify the practice of slavery in fact, what they taught was that black people were cursed and slavery was a part of their punishment. And they based that on the story in Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. Most of you know the story. Noah got drunk and passed out in his tent naked. Ham came into his tent, saw that Noah was passed out, and he dishonored him. Now, verse number 24 implies some type of sexual overtone, some type of homosexual activity. So when Noah broke, uh, woke up, he realized what Ham had done, and he cursed Ham's firstborn son, Canaan. Now, cursing a, first, uh, cursing a person's firstborn son was a way of cursing a person's descendants. Look at verses 25 and 26. This is what Noah did after he woke up and realized what Ham had done to him. Notice what it says. He, referring to Noah, said, Cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. So this was the passage of scripture that was used to try and justify the enslaving of black people. And pastors all over the south would preach this. Now, this is beyond ridiculous for two reasons. First of all, nothing is said in the scriptures about Canaan and his descendant skin turning colors. They just made that up. And secondly, the descendants of Ham were the Canaanites, which were Caucasians. In other words, white skin. You see, the Canaanites were descendants of Canaan, who, as I said earlier, was the firstborn son of Ham. Look at Genesis chapter 9, verse number 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. So the Canaanites were descendants of Ham and they were white. They were Caucasians. In fact, DNA analysis reveals that the Canaanites migrated from the Caucasus Mountains. 
And Caucasus is where we get the word Caucasian. So using that story to justify this practice of slavery of black people was ridiculous. But that's what churches in the South taught. And they did that so they could justify slavery. But that just goes to show how people will go to great lengths and distort scripture in order to justify their sin. Oh yeah. How far will you go? Will you distort scripture to try and justify the things that you're doing? What's sad is that's human nature. So it's not just America that has an unsavory past. It's also the churches in America, especially the churches in the South. Now, let's talk about racism and what the Bible has to say about it. And let's start by defining the term racism. What is racism? Well, if you're taking notes, write this down. Racism is defined as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their race. Now, the root cause of, of racism is the belief that one race is superior to the other races. Let me say that again. If you want to know what the root cause of racism is, it's the belief that one race is superior to all the other races. And that's where the term white supremacy comes from. It's a term that describes the belief that whites are superior to all others. Now, believe it or not, this is a relatively new term. It was coined shortly after Charles Darwin published his book on the origin of species in 1859. Before that time, you won't find that term. It was actually coined by Charles Darwin. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. But it's also a term that's used primarily in America and Western Europe. Because those are the geographical areas in which the term white supremacy was coined and proliferated. But you need to realize that every ethnic group has been guilty at one time or another of being racist towards other ethnic groups. That is so important I'm going to say it again. Because today, we tend to think that the only one who can be racist are whites. And people, that's not true. Every ethnic group has been guilty at one time or another of being racist towards other ethnic groups. Racism has existed since, existed since the Tower of Babel. And some say since the fall of man, because that's where sin started. And where you have sin, you'll find racism. Now, let me explain the role that Charles Darwin in his book on the origin of the species played and the coining of the term white supremacy. Charles Darwin believed that man evolved and that different races were at different places on the evolutionary scale. Now, that's important that you catch that, so in case you were asleep at the time, let me say that again. Charles Darwin believed that different races were at different places on the evolutionary scale. In other words, he believed that certain races had evolved more than others. And that some races were less evolved than others. That's why some cultures were more primitive and other cultures were more advanced. It's because some races were more evolved than others and some races were less evolved. Therefore, the most evolved race, which in his opinion were Caucasians, whites, should dominate all of the less evolved races. Now, listen to me because this is very important. Racism did not begin with Charles Darwin. No. It has existed since the Tower of Babel. However, Darwin did more than any other person to popularize it and provide justification for it through pseudoscience. False science. And I say that because in the late 19th and early 20th century, it began to be accepted as scientific proof. Yeah, it's scientific truth. That's why Hitler believed in a master race. He was a white supremacist who believed in the theory of white supremacy. But the point that I'm trying to make is this. The root cause of all racism is the belief that all races are not equal. In other words, one race is superior and the other races are inferior. And some are more inferior than others. So most racists have a scale in which they categorize the different races according to superiority and inferiority. Yeah. Let me give you an example. You probably, or if you've ever been racist or you know of a racist person, they probably think like this. Whites are here 
Native Americans are here. Asians are here. Arabs are here. Blacks are here. Aborigines, etc., etc. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because most people do it, even if it's subconsciously. Yeah. But the root cause of all racism is the belief that all races are not equal. And that's what needs to be addressed, especially in the churches today. Because as long as that belief exists, there will be racism. So what does the Bible have to say about racial equality? Well, that's what we're going to find out this morning. We're going to start with the basics. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Man did not evolve. He was created. Let me say that again. Man did not evolve. He was created. In fact, the Bible states that the entire human race descended from one man and one woman, Adam and Eve. So all people come from one set of parents, Adam and Eve. Who were created by God. Adam was created from the dust of the ground. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 2 verse number 7. And God cloned Eve from Adam. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 through 22. You know I can remember when cloning was such a big deal. And you know Lisa had been reading something about it. And she said what do you think about cloning? I said well of course it exists. God was the first one who did that. He cloned Eve from Adam. So listen to me. There are not multiple races there's only one race the human race but today we use the term race to describe different ethnic groups but technically we shouldn't do that because there's really only one race which is the human race does that make sense now today because that term has evolved we use the word race to refer to different ethnic groups so today I'm going to do the same thing because you're used to that but I want you to understand that technically that's not correct. Biblically, that's not correct. Because according to the Bible, there's only one race, the human race. Is everyone with me? Good. Now that's what the Old Testament teaches. And the New Testament confirms that. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse number 26. And I'll prove it to you. Notice what it says. From one man. Who's the one man? Adam. From one man, he. Who is he referring to? God. Why is it not capitalized? Because the NLT didn't do it, but it should have. From one man, Adam, he, God, created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. And he determined their boundaries. Do you see that? Every nation, every ethnic group comes from one man, Adam. All of us are descendants from Adam and Eve. The Old Testament teaches it. The New Testament confirms it. So when God looks at people, he doesn't look at their skin color or their physical appearance. God looks at their heart. In fact, the Bible goes out of its way to not make physical appearance a way of separating or differentiating people. Notice what Peter said in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35 about God. Because the way God treats people is the way we should treat people. So notice what it says. He said, God does not show favoritism, but he accepts men from every nation. Now what does that mean? Well, notice that phrase, show favoritism. Show favoritism, that phrase is translated from the Greek word prosopoletes. And prosop Prosopoletes is a compound word, which simply means it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The word prosopon, which means face, and lambano, which means to take. Now, when you combine these two words, it literally means to take a look at a person's face. What? So what this is saying is, God does not take a look at man's face. So, what this is saying literally is, God does not look at a person's face, he looks at their heart. In other words, God doesn't look at a person's appearance, he doesn't look at their skin color or physical features, he looks at what's on the inside. But that brings up a very interesting question. 
If every race or ethnic group descended from Adam and Eve, how did we get all of these different ethnic variations? I mean, sometimes you can just look at a person and you go, Hispanic, black, Caucasian, Italian, Chinese, Japanese. How can we do it? Where do we get all of these ethnic variations? In other words, how did we get all of the different skin colors and textures of hair associated with different races of people? How did we get all of the different facial features and body types associated with different ethnic groups? Well, believe it or not, it's not that big of a mystery, at least biologically. In fact, the Bible explains how we got all of the different ethnic variations. It's because of what happened at the Tower of Babel. Here's how it's described in the book of Genesis. This is Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 through 9. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel. Because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way... He scattered them all over the world. And that's why even to this day, we say that someone's babbling when they don't make sense. Yeah, they're just babbling. So how does the story of the Tower of Babel explain how we got all of the different races that we see today? Well, the separation that happened created the circumstances that facilitated all of the physical variations of the human family. Now, rather than trying to give you a mini lesson on genetics and boring you to death, I want you to watch this quick video. Let's run it. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children and those children had children and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark. And according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. Ooh. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. 
Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. We'll have a test next week. In essence, when you take a rich genetic pool coupled with the dispersal of the human family over the world, you have a perfect environment for de developing all the different types of races you see today. In other words, all of the different physical characteristics associated with different ethnic groups such as skin color, hair texture, facial features, etc. is easily explained scientifically. It's genetics. And the Bible explains it in the story of the Tower of Babel, and science backs it up. But my point is this. We all come from Adam and Eve. So technically, there's only one race, the human race. And that's why God doesn't look at the person's appearance. He doesn't look at the face of a person. He doesn't look at their skin color or their physical features. He looks at what's on the inside. And as Christians, that's what we're supposed to do. We're not to look at a person's appearance. We're not to look at a person's skin color or hair texture or facial features or body types. But we're to look at what's on the inside of that person. Because in God's eyes, all people are created equal. All men are descendants of Adam and Eve. And all men are made in the image of God. So there's not a race, or I should say, there's not one race that's superior to all the other races. And neither is there one race that's inferior to all the other races. However, it is true that some cultures are more superior than others. Let me say that. I'm probably irritating some of you, but it's true. There are some cultures that are more inferior than, or more superior than others, and some cultures that are more inferior than others. But that's only because their customs and social institutions are either based on biblical principles or they're not based on biblical principles. And if they're based on biblical principles, then those cultures lead to advancement and success. If they're not based on biblical principles, then guess what? They're not going to advance like the others. If you study the Bible, one of the things that you'll find as you study history is that those, those nations that followed biblical principles, even if they didn't know about them, they didn't even know about the Bible. They were more advanced and they were more successful. That's just the way it works. In fact, the more that we base our culture on biblical principles, the more successful we will become. Christianity believes that marriage is between one man and one woman and that that constitutes a family. Science proves that children will be more healthy. They will be and I'm going to be honest with you, they're going to do better in school. I'm not going to say they're more intelligent, but I'm going to say they're going to be better in school. They're going to advance more. They're going to be more successful because you follow biblical principles. If you create a culture that doesn't require a man being in the home, doesn't have a father inside the home, majority of children are growing up in fatherless homes, they are not going to succeed like others. What's the difference? One ethnic group has a culture that believes in biblical principles and sets the family up according to those biblical principles, and another doesn't. As you study through history, you'll find that almost all great scientists were Christians. They believed that God brought order. There wasn't just this chaos. Sometimes this happened. Sometimes it didn't. They believed that God set forth certain laws. And as a result of those laws, you would get the very same outcome every time if you followed those laws. And as a result of that, those societies began to advance. It has nothing to do with one race is more superior than the others. It has to do with that race, their culture, is being set up on biblical principles. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, let's talk about shadow racism. How many of you know what shadow racism is? How many of you never even heard of the term shadow racism? All right. Well, it's kind of hard to define. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to ex try to explain what it is without really giving you a definition until after I explain it. And then after I explain it, you're going to go, oh, okay, I understand what it is. A shadow 
is an image that's seen when an object blocks the source of the light. If I'm standing outside on a sunny day, I can see my shadow because it's caused by my body blocking the light or blocking the sun. Now, if it's directly overhead, then I'm going to barely see a shadow. But even now, I can look backwards and I can see my shadow. I can throw up my hand because my body is blocking these lights. So there's an image that's seen as a result of my body blocking the source of light. Does that make sense? All right. And sometimes, I don't like it, but sometimes my shadow reveals something about me that I didn't see or didn't know about myself until I saw a shadow or my shadow. As an example, I don't see myself as fat or bald. It's kind of funny. I am 60 years old and I still see myself the way I looked in high school, skinny with long hair. Lisa posted some pictures. We celebrated our 40th anniversary on Friday, and she's big into this. I'm not big into it, but she'll post pictures on Facebook. So she went all the way back to high school, and she posted some pictures. And I looked at those pictures and looked at some of the comments, and people really made fun of them. And the reason they were making fun of them is because I don't, I don't look anything like I did back then. But you know what's funny? When I looked at those pictures, I thought, well, that's the way I still look today. Skinny with long hair. Yeah. But when I look at my shadow, I don't see that. I see the image of a fat man with no hair. And people, that's what shadow racism is. It's seeing prejudice that you didn't realize you had until a moment of light revealed a shadow of it. Let me say it again. That's the definition of shadow racism. It's seeing prejudice that you didn't realize you had until a moment of light revealed a shadow of it. Now, let me give an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Most of us, I believe, would condemn, condemn racism in any and every form. If you're a white person, you would say that you're not right, racist towards black people, Hispanic, Asians, or Jews. You don't believe in segregation. You never identify with white supremacists. And of course, you would never condone violence against someone simply because of the color of their skin. In fact, if someone was to ask you, you would tell them that there's not a racist bone in your body. And you believe that with all of your heart. And then you see a white woman dating a black man. And you don't like it. Now, you don't know anything about that man. You don't know anything about his character or his faith. You don't know anything about his work ethic or his values. It's just, he's black, and she's white. And at that moment, you see racial prejudice that you didn't realize you had until a moment of light, an incident, revealed a shadow of it. That's shadow racism. Now, let me be honest with you. Whites are not the only ones that's guilty of shadow racism. Let me say that again, because our society, and especially our media, is trying to make it sound like whites are the only ones that's guilty of this. But whites are not the only ones guilty of shadow racism. When most black women see a black man dating a white woman, they don't like it. That's shadow racism. When many Hispanic women see a Hispanic man dating a white woman, they don't like it. That's shadow racism. So it's not just whites that are guilty of shadow racism. The truth is, racism is alive and well within every ethnic group. We might call it reverse racism, but the truth is, it's racism. Listen to me. Any time that a person is prejudiced, or discriminates, or is antagonistic towards another person, or people on the basis of their race, it's racism. Regardless of what you've been told, racism is not exclusive to whites. Any person in any ethnic group can be a racist. There's as many racists in the black community as there are in the white community. There's as many Asian racists as there are African racists. It's not exclusive to any ethnic group. But my point is this. I'm kind of getting off topic. Shadow racism is when you see, a ra see racial prejudice within you that you did not realize you had until a moment of light, in other words, an incident, revealed a shadow of it. I used interracial dating as an example, but it can be anything that reveals racial prejudice within a person that they didn't realize they had until an incident revealed it. Now, let me give you a biblical example of shadow racism. 
This is the story about Moses, and it's found in Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now, if you don't mind, instead of reading all 11 verses, let me give you a quick synopsis of it. And later on, we'll just look at various verses as we go through it. So here's a quick synopsis of it. Moses married a Cushite woman, an Ethiopian who was black. You see, the land of Cush is what is now known as Ethiopia. And Ethiopians are, and they were back at that time, black. Now, his family didn't like it, especially his brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam. In fact, they were so upset, they wanted him removed from leadership. In their opinion, marrying a black woman was so wrong, so bad, so unnatural, that Moses should no longer be the leader of Israel. He should be removed as the leader. So they led a rebellion against him, a coup, by going to others and criticizing Moses behind his back. Now, Moses probably had no idea that this was going on because they weren't doing it in front of him. But God saw it. So God called all three of them to the tabernacle. And then he called out Aaron and Miriam and they stepped forward. You know what? It's just 11 verses. And it's such a good story. Let's read it. Notice what it says. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman, an Ethiopian, a black woman. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he spoken through us too? But the Lord heard them. They were doing it behind Moses' back. Moses didn't hear them, but God sees everything. Now, Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. I love that. You know why I love that? Guess who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses. Now, again, he wrote it under the inspiration of God. So God's writing it, telling him what to write. But can you imagine writing this about yourself? Now, Alan was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. All of you would say, that ain't true. But anyways, so immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, Go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. I always wondered when I read this, did they think they were going to be rewarded or did they think they were going to be rebuked? You know, you really don't know. He called them to the tabernacle. Maybe they're thinking that, you know, he's going to side with us. Or maybe they're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, we really goofed up. I think they thought we really goofed up. But anyways, and the Lord said to them, now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions. They'd go into an open-eyed trance, in other words. I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. Of all my house... The house of God means of all humans, of all my house. Because when you talk about your house, you're talking about your family, all right? He is the one I trust. Wow. I speak to him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? The Lord was very angry with them. And he departed. As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, there stood Miriam. Her skin as white as snow from leprosy. When Aaron saw what had happened to her, he cried out to Moses. Oh, my master, please don't punish us for this sin. We have so foolishly committed. Now, do you see the irony And what God did to Miriam. You see, if you had leprosy, you became an outcast because of your skin. And you were excluded from the community of Israel. Now, racism does the very same thing. Racism excludes people based on the color of their skin. And let's be honest, the only reason Miriam did what she did was because she was a racist. If you would have asked her, are you racist? Oh, no. Look, the Cushite woman's with us as we're going through the wilderness. Remember, a mixed multitude came with them. So she would have said, no, there's not a racist bone in my body until her brother married this black woman. But the only reason she did what she did was 
because she was a racist. So God gave her a taste of what racism really feels like. He gave her leprosy. He caused her skin to turn white with leprosy. And because of her skin color, she was going to be excluded from the community, treated as an outcast. Of course, you know the story. Moses cried out to God to forgive her and to heal her. But I want you to notice God's response. Look at verses 13 through 15. So Moses cried out to the Lord, oh God, I beg you, please heal her. It's his sister. In fact, she's the one when he was put into the basket. that She ran to Pharaoh's daughter and said, I know a woman that can nurse her for you. So her and her mama raised Moses in Pharaoh's palace. So this is why, like a second mama to Moses. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had done nothing more than spit in her face, wouldn't she be defiled for seven days? So keep her outside of the camp for seven days, and after that she may be accepted back. So Miriam was kept outside of the camp for seven days, and the people waited until she was brought back before they traveled again. Woo. Miriam got a taste of what it feels like to be excluded from society because of your skin. Miriam got a taste of what it's like to be the recipient of racism. But there's another truth here I want you to see. God did not have a problem with interracial marriage. In fact, he defended it. Because God doesn't see it as interracial marriage. Why? Because to God, there's one race. The human race. And for them... To look at someone and exclude them for the color of their skin. It irritated him because God shows no favoritism. God does not look or does not take the appearance of the face and look at it. He looks at what's on the inside. Yeah. Now, what does it mean to be woke? Woke. You know, that's a term that's being used a lot in today's society. But what does it mean? How many of you feel like you're woke? How many of you go, yeah, I hear that term, I really don't know what it means. Well, what does it mean? Well, it used to mean being with it, on top of things. Knowing what's happening or what's going on. But in today's society, it's taken on a more specific meaning. It's more focused. Today, it conveys the idea of being awakened to matters of social injustice, particularly racism. It means that you're more introspective and you're looking for shadow racism in your own life and in society. Of course, it's gotten out of hand recently. In that, now we're looking for shadow racism in other people's lives. And that is not what God has called us to do. We're to judge ourselves and not others. I'm supposed to cast the beam out of my own eye before I try and take the speck out of your eye. But that's not what's happening in today's society. Today, groups are going around searching for shadow racism in every corner of our society and in others, and they're calling people racist who aren't racist. And you can ruin a person's life doing that, especially in today's culture. Listen, we need to be introspective, and we need to look at ourselves. The change begins in us. If you want to be woke, let us start with you. Now, yes, we need to stand up and be against social injustice and racism. But don't ever accuse someone or the system of being racist if it's not true. Because in today's society, in a cancel culture, you can ruin a person or you can ruin a business simply by making an accusation like that. You know, used to it wasn't that way, but with social media, it is that way. I want you to notice what God says. This is Micah chapter 6. Verses 7 through 8. It's not going to come up on the screen. It's just something I wanted this morning as I was praying. I thought, I need to share this with you. What pleases God? What pleases Him? Well, it says this, Micah chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, for me to make myself right with God, what do I need to do? Sacrifices, offerings, what can I give? 
you asked, you asked Abraham to offer up Isaac, his only son. Of course, you stopped that. But Abraham was going to do it because he believed that you made these promises and that Isaac would be resurrected if he took his life because you called him. You called him to do this, God. So he's asking, what pleases God? Do all of these sacrifices, things that we do for him, does that please God? Well, here's what the prophet Micah said, verse 8. He hath showed you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Justly means justice. When we see injustice, we need to stand up. We need to say that's not right. Even if it makes other people irritated at us. I'm going to tell you some stories about my personal life. I'm 60 years old. I'm on that cutting edge where I saw America making the change. My wife is two years younger and she doesn't remember any of this. But in 1964, my dad graduated from the University of Arkansas. My parents attended First Baptist Church, Bedville, Arkansas. And in 1964, it was the spring, my dad and mom were getting ready to graduate. They integrated the pools, the city pools. They had been segregated up until that time. You had pools for the blacks and pools for the whites. And the pastor got up and he said, because they had made this public, that they were integrating the pool systems. And he said, if I catch any of you, your children, swimming, and he made a racial slur. And this was the pastor. My mom and dad never went back to that church. In 1967, we moved to Tahlequah. 1967 was the year that Tahlequah integrated the school system. I'd never seen a black child in school until my third grade year. I never really thought about it because we came from Bartlesville. But as I got ready to go into fourth grade, we moved, and I played baseball, and my dad was coaching my baseball team. And I'll never forget this. I remember this from going into fourth grade. The person over the baseball league came up to my dad, and he said, George, I have two black boys. No other coach will take them. Would you mind them being on your team? I'm sitting there hearing this. I don't mind a bit. Robin and Stephen. My dad would pick them up for practice. And when, every once in a while, we'd give them a ride home. Or they'd want to walk around at the campus because we practiced up at Northeaster. We gave a ride home. We always stopped. Used to have a quick trip here, if you remember. Stop in and get a coolie. But we only did that when Robin and Stephen were with us. And I noticed that. Believe it or not, sometimes I'm pretty sharp. And I noticed Dad didn't do that when it was just us, but if he had them. And so then one day I said, Dad, how come we never get a coolie when they're not with us? He said, son, you have no idea how people are treated. And I hope you never see it. When I was in fifth grade, they were having sit-ins up here at Northeastern State University. We had one car, and my dad was walking to work because he'd loaned the car out. The phone rang, and I picked it up. And we were taught to answer the phone, Nolan Reston's Allen speaking. Oh, I hated that. None of my friends did that. They just said hi. We got in trouble for doing that. You said, Nolan Reston's Allen speaking. And this man said, is your dad home? And he was, you could tell he was mad. I said, yes, I'll, I'll get him. And I heard him cussing through the phone at my dad. Now, my dad got mad. He cussed like a sailor, too. And he just cussed him out and told him he'd give and loan his car to anyone he wanted. Because what my dad had done is my dad had a student who was graduating. He was black. And he had no car. And he wanted to be able to interview for jobs. And he had to drive. And he had no way to get to these different interviews. So for a week and a half, my dad loaned our car out for him to go and interview. And because we were one-car family... My dad walked to work and walked home. Walked and got the groceries and brought them back home. 
And people were mad at him. I'll never forget the cussing I heard on that phone. My dad retaliated back. But my parents taught me from a very early age that what God requires is justice. Social justice for everyone. To love mercy and to walk humbly. Why is that important? Because no one is superior to anyone else. We're all created by God, made in His image, and we come from one race. Uh, let me just say this is probably the sermon that I dreaded more than the other three. I really debated on whether or not to teach it. I know that this could probably cause more offense than anything else, but I also believe that it's my job to teach the truth. The Bible says that love rejoices in the truth. So before I get started, um, why don't you pray with me? Father, I just love you and thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you most of all, Lord, for what's coming. I thank you for your return. That one day, God, you're coming here to establish your kingdom on this earth. And Lord, we'll see things as they really are. And God, we'll act and operate according to your principles and values. And God, it would be a time for us to see how it was before the fall. Now, God, I pray that you would season uh, my speech with grace, that, Lord, everything I say would come from a right heart and be full of love. Pray, God, that you would anoint people to have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to them. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this morning's message will be my fourth and last sermon on the subject of racism. In fact, we've entitled this series, The Bible and Racism. Now, if you haven't listened to the very first three sermons, I encourage you to do so because racism is an issue that will not be going away anytime soon. And as a Christian, you need to know what the Bible has to say about it. Truthfully, I don't really care what your opinion is on the subject of racism, and you shouldn't care what my opinion is on the subject of racism. But as a Christian, you should care and know what the Bible has to say about it. Now, in the first two sermons, I discussed the subject of slavery in America and how it violated the very core values that our country was built upon. You see, the majority of our founding fathers were Christians. So their failure to abolish slavery became a black eye to all of Christianity. But even worse, it gave the impression that the Bible condones the practice of slavery. And that is not true. In fact, the Bible clearly teaches that all men are created equal by God and endowed with unenalienable rights, with the chief one being liberty, which is freedom. So in the first two sermons of this series, I showed from the scriptures that God has never, ever condoned the practice of slavery. In fact, it's an abomination to him, and he strictly forbids it. It's one of the few crimes that carried with it the death penalty. In the third sermon of the series, I addressed the root cause of racism, which is the belief that one race is superior to all of the other races. And I proved from the Bible that that isn't true. There's only one race, the human race. Because all men are descendants of Adam and Eve, and all men are made in the image of God. So there's not one race that's superior to all of the other races, and neither is there one race that's inferior to all of the other races. I also talked about shadow racism, and I explained what it is, and the fact that whites are not the only ones guilty of shadow racism. The truth is, racism is alive and well within every ethnic group. We might call it reverse racism, but the truth is, it's racism. Listen to me. Anytime a person is prejudiced or discriminates or is antagonistic towards another person or group of people based on their skin color, it is racism. Regardless of what you've been told, racism is not exclusive to whites. Any person in any ethnic group can be a racist. If you're prejudiced or you discriminate, or you're antagonistic towards a person or a group of people because of the color of their skin, you're a racist. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk about civility and civil rights. In fact, that's the title of this morning's sermon, Civility and Civil Rights. Now, before I jump into this morning's message, if you don't mind, let me define both of those terms to make sure that we're all on the same page. So, what do I mean by civility? 
Well, civility is defined as civilized conduct, especially politeness, courtesy, and most of all, lawfulness. And by lawful, we mean obeying the law. So if you're not polite, courteous, and obeying the law, you're not being civil. We would say you were uncivil. Because in a civilized society, we follow the law. We're polite to each other. We're courteous to each other. If we're not polite, we're not courteous. If we don't follow the law, then we're uncivilized. Everyone with me? Good. Now, what do we mean by civil rights? We use that term all the time. I think everyone knows what civil rights are, but at the same time, if I asked you to define it, you might not be able to do that. So, civil rights is defined as the rights of citizens to political and social equality. In other words, civil rights ensure that everyone is entitled to participate in society without discrimination or repression. So when we talk about civility and civil rights, we're talking about the right way to protest inequality versus the wrong way to protest. The civilized way to protest versus the uncivilized way to protest. In other words, if you think your civil rights or the civil rights of a, of a particular group are being violated, how do you protest? Now again, I really don't care what your opinion is on the subject matter, and you shouldn't care what my opinion is on the matter, but as a Christian, you and I should care and know what the Bible has to say about it, because the Bible is the standard by which we live. Some of you have forgotten that. The Bible is the standard by which we live. It's sad, but George Barna has done so many polls, and he's done so much research, and he actually says that we're now living in the second reformation of the church. You guys remember the first reformation? The, the church decided to reform itself or wanted to reform itself. And so they were called protesters by those who didn't think that there needed to be a reformation. And that's where we get the name Protestants. They stayed in the Roman Catholic Church. We came out as protesters or Protestants. But we really didn't want to come out. What we really wanted to do was reform the church. We wanted the church to get back to the word of God and that be the standard by which we live. But here's what's interesting. The church is now going through a second reformation, but it's not in a good way. Now, what we're trying to do is define what we believe by our culture. We're changing what we believe to line up by what we believe in our culture. The church is being reformed to be politically correct. That's very sad. So, as I said, we need to understand that the Bible is the standard by which we live, and it doesn't matter how the culture changes. We should and always will live by what the Word of God says. So, if my civil rights are being violated, or the civil rights of a group are being violated, how should I protest according to the Bible? What's acceptable, what's civilized, and what's not acceptable? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us that we're never to repay evil with evil. Notice what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Martin Luther King, who was the civil rights leader of the 60s, said this. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred confuses life. Love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life. Love illuminates it. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. If anyone had a right to to hate it would be Martin Luther King but Martin Luther King knew that writing and looting would never change the hearts of man only love could he understood that if he chose to retaliate then he would lose the support of those who were sympathetic to his cause let me say that again Martin Luther King was a brilliant man and he understood that if he retaliated he would lose the support of those who were sympathetic to his cause. Do you know what changed the tide in the civil rights movement? 
Anyone know in the 60s? Selma, Alabama. You ought to watch the movie. Great movie. It's going to make you cry. But there was a picture that was taken, and of course Time and Life magazine ran all these pictures, but there was one picture that turned the tide of the civil rights movement. Let me show you that picture. When you see it, you see an innocent young black man who's protesting peacefully. And you see a police with a German shepherd that's very violent. And you look at that and you think, that's not right. That picture, more than anything else, changed the heart of America. Now, I want you to notice what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. What's kind of interesting, to ma'o, this word honorable, in Greek it's to ma'o. It really talks about being civilized, polite, courteous, lawful. Yeah. Now, if you think of it like that, I want you to notice what this verse is saying. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are civil. Wow. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. There's a time where you have to defend yourself. But we're to leave with peace, if at all possible, with all men. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. You see, once protesting descends into rioting and looting, it's no longer a protest. It's criminal activity. And the Bible condemns it. And not only do you lose God's support for your cause, but you also lose the support of those who are sympathetic to your cause. In fact, let me give you more scripture to back up what I'm saying because it was kind of a toss-up. What scripture do I use to give the people? Because they all say the same thing. And, you know, I, I lost count of how many scriptures say this. Never repay evil with evil. Never take vengeance. Allow the Lord to do that. So let me just give you a few. We're not going to read them. You can write them down and go and look at them uh, later. But these are a few scriptures, and let me tell you, there's probably 10 times more than this. Proverbs 20, 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 29. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Leviticus 19, 18 goes all the way back to the Levitical law. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And as I said, there's tens and times tens more. So let me give, give you a principle if you're taking notes. I want you to write this down. Here it is. God expects us to be civil when it comes to protesting for civil rights. Rioting and looting is unacceptable. Not only is it displeasing to God, but it's also unproductive because you lose the support of those who are sympathetic to your cause. You might be angry, but you're allowing your anger to cause you to sin, which is a big no-no to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says, Be ye angry. Now, you know what's interesting? This is a command. It's written in the imperative mood. And what this is saying is God commands us to get angry at certain things. When you see someone's civil rights being taken away or being violated, it should make you angry. When you see the innocent being uh, exploited by those who have power, that should make you angry. That's why the Bible says, be ye angry. And it's a command. God is saying, get angry. He doesn't want us to be pacifist. But then he goes further. Be ye angry and sin not. You control your anger. You make sure that it's, it's controlled in a productive way. Then it goes further. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know, most of us were taught, you don't go to, mat, go to bed angry with each other, husband and wife. No, 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 no. Go to bed angry. You'll wake up with cooler heads in the morning. That's not what this verse is saying. What it's saying is be angry, don't sin, don't let the sun go down your wrath. In other words, you make sure you do something that you're angry about. You just make sure that you don't sin when you do it. And then he goes further just to make sure you get the point. Neither give place to the devil. Burning innocent people's businesses down, looting, destroying property, throwing rocks and bricks is sin. It's giving in to the devil. And let me just say this. Christians cannot support that. Now, let's get to the meat of the matter. And let's answer the question that everyone is asking and everyone wants answered. Which is this. Alan, as a Christian, do you support Black Lives Matter? 
Pastor, do you support Black Lives Matter? Well, here's my answer. I support the statement, Black Lives Matter. Why? Because Black Lives Matter. You know, when we're coming in and we want to fight cancer and we say that cancer sucks, sometimes we'll single out one thing and we'll say breast cancer sucks. And there's nothing wrong with that. And let me tell you, in a time period where blacks are having their civil rights or had their civil rights being violated, then we have every right to come in and say and single them out. Black lives matter. That is a correct statement. I have no problem with that. So I support the statement black lives matter because black lives matter. I do not support the organization black lives matter. As a Christian, I cannot support and will not support the group Black Lives Matter. Why? Because their mission is anti-Christian and detrimental to America. They are, for all intents and purposes, a cultural Marxist organization. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. In fact, how many of you had a political science course in college? You're going to lo learn more about political science in 40 minutes with me than you did in that whole semester. Yeah. Now, I'll talk a little bit about cultural Marxism in just a second. But first, let me show you the mis mission of Black Lives Matter, their organization, in their own words. They've taken this down, but this was on their official website. We actually took a picture of it because I was afraid that they would take it down. And here's what's interesting. I was right. They took it down. But I think recently they have put it back up. So this is what they wrote under what we believe. It should be coming up. I couldn't get it all on one slide, so I had to put it on another slide. But notice what it says in their own words. We are self-reflexive. That's a very important term. I'll come back and explain what that means in just a second. We are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege. Does everyone know what cisgender is? Cis means to have the same as. So if you were born with, men, uh, with male genitalia, and you identify as a man, then you are cisgender. If you were born with man or male genitalia and you identify as a woman, you are not cisgender. Does that make sense? All right, so they're to do the work required to dismantle, dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women, who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. Now, let me explain what self-reflexive means. Self-reflexive means that the organization is a reflection or an image of its founders. If you want to know what, the, what Black Lives Matter is all about, their organization is self-reflexive. It is a mirror. It's an image of who founded them. And its founders are Alicia Garza, Opal Tomiti, and Patrice Kohlers. Two of them identify as queer. That is not the term I would have used. I would have used a more politically correct term of being lesbians, but that's the term they use. So, two identify as queer, Elise, Alicia and Patrice, and both of their partners are transgender. So the organization reflects their personal life and focuses on, pro on promoting the LGBTQ agenda, especially for women. Now, let's keep reading. We disrupt. Now, that word disrupt means to use violence if necessary. All right? We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. Husband or father, wife, mother, children. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other's extended families and villages that collectively care for one another. In other words, they want to destroy or tear down the Christian family mo model, which is father, mother, children. That's what they mean by disrupt, to use violence even if necessary. People, this is an anti-Christian organization. Notice what else they say about their group. This is in their own words. This is coming right off their website. I am not changing the wordage in any, any way. All right, here's what it says. We foster a queer-affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual. Do you see that? 
They want to free America from heteronormative thinking. In other words, promote the idea that heterosexuality is not the norm. And to think so is both oppressive and intolerant. But people, that's not all. Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors also claim to be trained Marxist. Now, this isn't me describing them. This is how they describe themselves. And if you don't believe me, just go to Black My blacklivesmatter.com her story not history her story it's up there on the screen you can write it down and go to it so this is an anti-christian organization that's anti-traditional family and pro-lgbtq established by people who are self-admittingly or self-admittedly anti-christian and marxist so to answer your question, do I support Black Lives Matter? I support the statement, Black Lives Matter, because Black Lives Matter. But I do not support the organization, Black Lives Matter. As a Christian, I cannot support and will not support the group, Black Lives Matter. Now, I'm sure that some of you are probably embarrassed because you made it very public that you are a supporter of Black Lives Matter. And you made no distinction between the statement and the organization. But the truth is you spoke before you had all the facts. And people, that's always a recipe for disaster. I can tell you how many times I've been up here talking about Facebook and don't post this, don't post that. Because if you post before you have all the facts, it's always a recipe for disaster. You see, as a Christian, you should know who and what you're supporting. In fact, let me give you a principle. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this time down because this, is, this principle is going to guide you through turbulent times. And let me just tell you, it's only going to get more turbulent. And it doesn't matter who wins. You know, it's kind of being thrown out there. If Trump wins, boy, cities are going to burn. I'm here to tell you, if Biden wins, the violence isn't going to stop. Because these writers have an agenda, and it's not what you think it is. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me give you the principle. If you're taking notes, write this down. As a Christian, you don't ever jump on a wagon until you know whose wagon it is and where the wagon is going. You see, most of you jumped on the wagon of the Black Lives Matter movement organization, and you knew nothing about that group. But the reason you jumped on their wagon was because they shamed you for being silent. Oh yeah, silence is violence. If you're not speaking out, then you're supporting racism. So you jumped on the, on the wagon without doing any research on the organization. And I'll tell you why you did it. It's because you have a good heart. You're an anti-racist. You want to stand up and say... I'm an anti-racist. But you didn't make a distinction between the statement Black Lives Matter and the group Black Lives Matter. And in doing so, you violated a Christian principle. Notice what James chapter 1, verse number 19 says. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, especially on Facebook. and slow to get angry. Do you think that I wasn't pressured to speak out? I'm here to tell you, you wouldn't believe the nasty emails I received. And I really received them after George Floyd because I got up and I told you this. It broke my heart. I didn't see a black man with a, a white man having his knee on his neck. I saw a child of God there saying, I can't breathe. But I also knew we didn't have all the facts. And I also know that the majority of policemen are good-hearted and they're not racist. You have bad apples. People, you have bad apples that are pastors. We see it in the news all the time. And let me tell you when it happens, it's out there. You have bad apples in every profession. But when I received those nasty emails... And we're all upset because I wasn't teaching on racism immediately when the George Floyd thing happened. I want you to understand the reason I didn't do this is because this wasn't my first rodeo. 
I understand that for many of you, this was your first rodeo. And hopefully you got bucked off and learned. So what I did was I did a little research on the organization. In fact, the very first thing I did, which was very easy to do, is I went to their official website to check out this group. And guess what? I found out that they're a cultural Marxist group focusing on tearing down Christianity, Christianity values, Christianity principles, while promoting the LGBTQ agenda. Now, how many of you know what cultural Marxism is? Well, let me explain what cultural Marxism is, and then you'll understand the true agenda of the writers. If you go home and you Google, and this is why Google is not the best way to do research, cultural Marxism Wikipedia. It will say that cultural Marxism is a right-wing right conspiracy theory, and that's not true. In fact, let me just read something from the Bible. This isn't going to come up on the screen because I didn't tell them to do that. This is Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 12. Notice what this says. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Have you ever noticed whenever someone's upset, they always want to say it's a conspiracy? I don't really buy into conspiracy theories. And so if you study cultural Marxism, you type it in, it will say it's a right-wing conspiracy theory. But it's not. And the reason I know it's not is because I've read academia books on the subject. In fact, I have several in my library, and these are people who admit to being cultural Marxists. They'll explain what their cause is, why they're doing what they're doing, and you can get a good definition of it. So, what is cultural Marxism? Well, let's start with Marxism. Marxism is named after Karl Marx, who was a philosopher who was born in 1818 and died in 1883. The theory he proposed, and that's named after him, is what is known as a conflict theory. Because it states that society is at conflict with each other. And this conflict is between the rich and the poor. In fact, Marxism, as we understand it, is a political and economic philosophy as a way to create a more fair society. You see, Marxism saw capitalism as a system that made the rich richer and the poor poor. So it was unfair. And Marxism was a way to create a more fair society where the poor didn't stay poor and the rich didn't get richer at the expense of the poor. Now, to Marx, Karl, capitalism was the problem. In other words, capitalism was the culprit that caused this inequality between the two classes of people. So let's talk about capitalism because we talk about it all the time and I find that most people have no idea what it means. Capitalism is an economic system based on private ownership of the means of production. So in capitalism, you have two classes of people. You have the ones that own the big factories, the big businesses, the chain stores, the banks, etc., and the people who work for them. Yeah. The boss and the workers. Now, Marx referred to the owners as the bourgeoisie and the workers or the working class as the proletariat. Now, Marx believed that the owners were taking advantage of the workers because they were getting richer off of the production of the workers. So in his eyes, it was unfair. But the problem wasn't the owners. The problem was the system that allowed the owners to take advantage of the workers. In other words, the problem was capitalism. Now, to Karl Marx, the only solution was for the workers to revolt and for the people to take ownership of the means of production, which is another way of saying the government, because the government is supposed to be we the people, and this would create a more fair society. So Karl Marx really had a good heart, but he thought this would create a more fair society because everyone would get an equal share of the pie. Yeah. Instead of having this disparity of incomes between the two classes of people, the owners and the workers, the bourgeoisie and the proletarians, then everyone would be equal. Now, that's a broad overview of Marxism, and probably it's an inadequate explanation, only because I've made it very, very simple. But if you took a political science course, you probably said, why couldn't my professor explain it like that? Because it gives you a broad idea or a basic idea of what Marxism is. Now, as you know, many people took to heart the theory of Marxism and led revolutions. So now we have countries that 
a result of that, like Russia, China, North Korea, Vietnam. But it didn't happen in America. In fact, before I go on and talk about it not happening in America, does everyone know the difference between socialism and communism? You know, we throw this out, capitalism, socialism, uh, communism, and we most of the time don't know a difference because Marxism was calling for socialism that would eventually lead to communism. Socialism is where the government owns the means of production. So they own, well, they're in charge of the healthcare system, they're in charge of the energy sector, they're in charge of all of these things. Communism is where the government owns the means of production, but also owns all private property. How many of you remember Dr. Zhivago? Anyone ever seen the movie? Oh my gosh, you young people. What is it, five hours long? But it's a great movie. And you know when the Bolsheviks come in and the Communist Party comes in and takes power? He was a doctor. He had married into a family where his father-in-law was a doctor. And, you know, they were quite wealthy. And the Communists took over their house. And they had to be real careful. Why? Because in communism, the government owns even private property. So that's the difference between socialism and communism in a nutshell. I like to make things easy. So... Many people took this to heart, and we see the results of it, but it didn't happen in America. Because in America, capitalism thrived because laws that were based on Judeo-Christian principles and values kept capitalism in check. Laws and regulations protected the workers from unscrupulous owners while still allowing capitalism to prosper. So the rich, or so the owners got rich, and the workers prospered. So much more than the workers in socialistic and communist countries. In fact, workers had the ability to actually become owners and become rich themselves. Only in America do you have that dream. Only in America can you come in and say, you know, I started with nothing. I got a sixth grade education. I started doing a little bit of this. I started owning some of this. And before I know it, I'm a multimillionaire. Yeah. So workers in America rejected Karl Marx. They rejected Marxism. So Marxists had to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way to convince the workers that they were being oppressed by those in power. Remember, Marxism is a conflict theory. In other words, for Marxism to work, there has to be a conflict between two classes of people. And Americans weren't buying the economic argument that the rich were oppressing the poor. No, just the opposite was happening. Workers were prospering and even had opportunities to become rich. Now, trust me, it wasn't because the owners were these good-hearted people. Some were, but it's because we formed unions. It's because we passed laws that didn't allow them to be unjust. And we would come in and say, okay, you work overtime, then you're going to have to pay time and a half. You're going to have a minimum wage. We started doing all of these things, but they were based on Judeo-Christian principles. So just the opposite happened in America. Workers were prospering and even had opportunities to become rich. So the Frankfurt School, which was a group of Marxists from Frankfurt, Germany, realized that the only way they were going to get socialism in America was to divide the people into two groups and convince them that one group was oppressing the rest of them, to convince them that America's culture was oppressive. And one group that held all the power, they're the bourgeoisie, the oppressors. And everyone else was being oppressed. They're the proletarians, the ones being taken advantage of. So who are the oppressors? Who are the bourgeoisie? White, professional, male, Christian, cisgender, heterosexuals. Yeah. They're the bourgeoisie. And who are the oppressed? Who are the proletarians? Everyone and anyone that doesn't check... All of the boxes of the bourgeoisie. Everyone and anyone that can't check the boxes white, professional, male, Christian, cisgender, heterosexuals. And the more boxes you can't check, the more oppressed you are. Let me kind of explain it like this. This will help you. Each one of these are boxes that you want to be able to check. All right, so let's suppose that you're white, 
but you're blue collar. You're male, you're Christian, you're cisgender, you're heterosexual. I want you to understand you're still not the bourgeoisie. You're still not the oppressor. It's those dang factory owners, those rich people. Yes. All right, let's go a little bit further. Let's suppose that you're white, you're professional, but you're female. You're Christian, you're cisgender, you're heterosexual. Yeah. You can't check all the boxes. You're oppressed because it's those males. It's those white professional males that are putting that glass ceiling there that's keeping you back. That how dare you do that because she's a woman. But wait a minute, you want to be treated like a man? I don't know what to do. Yeah. Now, let's suppose you're not white. You're black. You didn't make it through high school, so we're going to say undereducated. You're female. You're not a Christian. You're Muslim. Now, normally you wouldn't do this, but we're going to do it. You're not cisgender. You're trans. And you're married to someone who's what you came to. So that's always kind of... If you are transgender and you marry someone... That's this. How do you know if you're homosexual? But anyways, uh, you know, that confuses me. I, but anyways, but you're homosexual. Let me tell you, you are the most oppressed. Because the system is made for this. And you don't fit into the system. Is everyone with me? Now, the only way to change things and stop the oppression is to tear down the system the caters to white professional male Christian cisgender heterosexuals. You see, this class conflict is a system. And let me explain what I mean by that. White, talking about race, is systemic racism. Because the system is made for the whites, it's not made for anyone else. So our system is systemic racism. See, systemic racism used to be, and there was systemic racism in America. Jim Crow laws. It was impossible to have separate but equal. That wasn't true. And every Christian should have been angry about that. Because in the kingdom of God, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's no color. We're all from the human race. But here's what I want you to understand. We did have a system in place that oppressed, that discriminated. That was antagonistic towards those who weren't white. And you didn't even have to be black. You could be maybe Native American Indian or you could be Asian. And you were still because the system was. So there was systemic racism. So guess what we did for Judeo-Christian principles and values? We came in and we made laws and we said, uh, we're not going to have that anymore. There's no segregation. We're desegregating. We're going to bus. We're going to stop all these Jim Crow laws. We're going to make it where everyone can vote. But we're going to go further. We're going to do affirmative action. And those, those programs were needed. But that was what was referred to systemic racism. So now when you hear systemic racism, you go, now wait a minute, there used to be, but there's not. Oh, yes, there is now today too because... The system's made for this. So they've changed the definition of system racism. Now let's go over here to male if you're female. Systemic misogyny. Just by being a woman, our system. Systemic misogyny. We come in cisgendered, heterosexual, systemic, transphobia, and homophobia. So we come in and we look at it and we say... We have systemic racism, we have systemic misogyny, we have systemic transphobia, systemic homophobia, yeah. But I want you to understand, you're looking at your pastor and the pastor is the man. I want you to understand something, I am the man. I am white, professional, male, Christian, cisgender, heterosexual. And the system is made for me. That's why people say, 
the man is keeping me down. Stick it to the man. People, I am the man. I'm a white, professional, male, Christian, cisgender, heterosexual. Yeah. The only problem with this is, as a Christian, this comes in and says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. That doesn't matter. There's neither male nor female. In professional, it doesn't matter whether you're slave or free. What matters is do you have Jesus or not? Now, they don't have Jesus. If they did, Jesus would be Lord, and they would come in and say, you know, this type of behavior, I, I can't do this. Now, you might argue with that. That's okay. We can have different opinions. But what the Bible tells me is I'm looking at this and saying I need to love them. I can't be mean, violent, bad, rude. No, I want them to know Jesus. So I'm going to love them so I can speak into their lives, so I can share with them Jesus. But I want you to understand, this is what's taking place, and this is how cultural Marxists see the system. So what is cultural Marxism? If you're taking notes, write this down. I'm going to give you a definition. Cultural Marxism is a movement to subvert our Western Christian culture in order to bring about Marxism, or in today's language, socialism. Because only socialism will make the system fair. And everyone will be equal according to Marxism. So what does this have to do with rioting and looting? Because we're seeing rioting and looting and you're going, oh, man, I was with you until you started doing this. What does this have to do with rioting and looting? Well, you have three groups involved in the rioting and looting. You have those who want to tear down the system in order to bring about Marxism. Yeah. There are only about 1% to 2% of them. So it's political. They're the ones that support and encourage them and don't denounce them unless they're put on the spot. But they're enabling it. Then you have those who are angry and are being played by the first group. They don't really know what's going on, but they think they're woke. They're just angry. We're going to burn it down. Yeah. They're being encouraged. They're being manipulated by the ones that want to tear the system down. Yeah. And last but not least, you have those who just want to vandalize and steal. So they're coming in. Now, as a Christian, what's our response to this? If you don't understand what's taking place, what's our response to this? Well, Micah chapter 6, verses 7 through 8 says, Should we offer him thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? In other words, how do we get right with God? We're living in this turbulent time. We're living in a time when no one can get along. They can't get along politically. They can't get along as neighbors. They can't get along religiously. My gosh, what do we do? What's God require of us living in this time? Do we have to make all these sacrifices? No. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right. What do we mean by right? We come in and we say, we don't care what the system is. In the kingdom of God, we're all of the human race. There's no black, there's no white, there's no brown, there's no yellow, there's no red. How many of you knew that Jesus loves the little children as racist? All the children of the world, red and yellow, white and black, they are precious, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children. Other words, we didn't mention brown. You racist singing that. See, we've gotten so caught up in this. What we need to understand is if we see any ethnic group being, we're to be angry about that because in the kingdom of God, there's neither Jew nor Greek. This doesn't matter because free or slave, it doesn't matter. God wants to bless them all. Male, there's neither male nor female. And then the only thing that really matters is if you have Jesus Christ in your heart. So for us, he tells us, what does God require for you to do what's right? You to love everyone. And then he goes further, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Yeah. That's what the Word of God says. Now, in living in this turbulent time, the best advice I can give you is this. Love Jesus and love people. And keep your mouth shut 
And don't take a side, especially on Facebook, unless you know all the facts. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17 says, The first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. You know what I learned? I learned very, very uh, early on. A wife and a husband might be having problems. A wife comes to me, she tells a story, and all of a sudden I think, man, that husband is a jerk. The problem's the husband. Husband comes to tell me, he does it there, and they're, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe she's the, let's bring them both in together. Yeah. And we don't debate on Facebook. Why do we not debate on Facebook? Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools or they will become wise in their own estimation. You look at that and you go, well, what am I supposed to do? It says don't answer them and then it says answer them. What do you do? Actually, this is a synthetic proverb. What it's telling you is it doesn't do any good whether you answer a fool or you don't answer a fool. They're a fool. So please don't engage them on Facebook. Now, in this time of politics, there's a reason why socialists gravitate towards one political party because they want class warfare. And people, there's no such thing as class warfare in the Christianity. There's only this. There's only, because there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer male or female. There's no longer servant or free. The only thing that matters is this one little thing. And that's what we concentrate on as Christians. We want to make sure that everyone is loved. Everyone gets a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we stand up for is Jesus. And Jesus wouldn't allow the oppressed to be oppressed. You go through the Bible and the thing that it's always telling you is you stand up for the widows. You stand up for the, for the uh, uh, orphans. And you stand up for those who can't stand for themselves. That's what we do as Christians. I believe in my heart that every one of us knows when we see injustice. We know immediately when we see it that that's not right. When we saw what was happening, George Floyd on the news, there's not a person that said that was right. Now, I'm not saying when you learn all the facts that the police officers weren't pumped up and whatever, but still, it doesn't matter. That wasn't right. Because we don't do that. There's only one race, and it's the human race. A stand. What you're going to find in this world is they want to divide you. Because if we can divide you, yes, we can conquer you. And then if we can divide you, hopefully you'll be on our side and our side will win. And we don't want division. It's not going to be that way. When Jesus comes back, let me tell you, <laughs> first of all, it says that he rules with a rod of iron. It'll be his way or the highway. But his way, according to the book of Exodus, is for, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy, it's for our good always. God doesn't come out and put hardship on us. He gives us things that are good for us. And that's what we want people to see. And as Christians, what we want to show is love. And if, if you're here this morning and you don't know the love of Jesus, let me just say this. Jesus didn't say, clean up first and then come to me. Get your life right and then come to church and then come to me. No, Jesus comes right where you are, as bad as you are. And he says, I am going to pay the penalty for your sin. And he did. The only difference between Christians and non-Christians is Christians realize what Jesus did. Jesus paid for our sin. Jesus paid for our sin. And when all our sin was paid for, God raised him from the dead. And we believe that those who put their trust in Jesus, because Jesus paid for their sin, one day we will live like Jesus. We will go where he is. We'll live with God because we believe in Jesus. If you're watching online, let me say this. You don't have to clean up before you come to Jesus. You come as you are.
and Jesus forgives you. So if you're here this morning, you've never received Jesus, I'm going to give you the chance to be cleaned by Him, to have your sins paid for by Him. So I want everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you're here this morning, never received Jesus, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. The prayer's not magic, but if you believe what you're saying, then you put your faith in Jesus and your sins will be forgiven because Jesus would have paid for them and he would have become Lord of your life. So here goes. God, I know I'm a sinner and I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, that his soul descended into hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe that when all my sin was paid for, God, you looked into hell and you saw a perfect soul. A soul that had never sinned. And according to Leviticus 18.5, God, you raised Jesus from the dead. I believe that my sins have been paid for by Jesus and I want him to be Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you said that prayer from the first, for the first time, the Bible says you need to confess that Jesus is now your Lord.